Thank you very much, Simone, and thank you very much also to the team behind the organization of this wonderful uh, conference. It's uh, such a pity that we can't all be together, but through the wonders of modern technology, here we are, and it's an absolutely fantastic experience. Thank you very much also to Professor Yokohari, who has um, uh, very clearly enunciated the relationships between green and cool and all the rest of it, which um, saves me a bit of time later on in my presentation. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I present from today. Um, that is the uh, Gadigal of the Yoran Nation. Now, the land is so important um, and it's so precious to us, but through haphazard, um, reckless and uh, frankly despicable decision-making over long periods of time, we have put it and us in frankly grave danger. Now, you wouldn't look at it, you wouldn't see it from a lot of the land that we see on our doorstep. If those of you who've been to Sydney, um, you'll recognize this as the Royal Botanic Gardens, um, right in the city center, set aside for people, for communities to come together, to keep cool, to meet with each other, to enjoy the resident wildlife in our one largest city in the country. Let me know if you come to Australia, by the way, in the near future. We would be delighted to meet up with you and to take you to one of my favorite green spaces. So here we are. This is my lab, um, which I co-founded with Xiao Chi Feng, who you will hear from later in the Healthier Cities panel um, on a different channel, I think. Um, we started the lab, oh gosh, it feels like 200 years ago, but it was about 20. 15, 2016, this was us before um, you know what happened in 2020. Um, a big bunch of diverse data scientists and statisticians and environmental health uh, uh, enthusiasts all coming together to do research on how it is that where we live is influencing our health for better and for worse. So let me walk you through some of the things that we've been doing together. Well, again, a long time ago in halcyon days gone by, uh, Xiao and I and various others from around the world were invited um, to be part of a workshop for international experts on green space and health, to really try and workshop how it is that more green seems to be associated with healthier communities. Here's the paper um, that was published from the group that you can see in front of you. And um, it was a really wonderful um, collegial group to be part of. Here's one of the key things that we came up with. This is now, um, I think, and judging by the number of citations it's received within such a short space of time, probably the definitive way of conceptualizing domains of pathways between green space on one hand and health on the other. Three domains of pathways which you can remember. The first is restoring capacities, and um, uh, those of you who are um, uh, reading up the literature on stress reduction theory and attentional restoration theory will know all too well about restoring capacities. The tendency for contact with nature and green space to help relieve levels of stress and take the edge off what we may have been worried about so we can now think about what we need to do to concentrate more carefully on various things, such as workplace, such as in school, such as whatever responsibilities we have in the home. Really important, the mental and psychological benefits from contact with nature. But that's not all. The middle one, um, building capacities, is as um, Michael Palin from the Monty Python Brigade, we used to say, a statement of the bleeding obvious, and that is, Green spaces can be very attractive places for us to spend time outside on our own, together, being physically active, walking, working up a sweat, doing some yoga, whatever it may be, preferential settings for maybe even walking the dog for many of you dog walkers and dog enthusiasts on the call. But it's not just that. Building capacities can also include connecting with other people. You don't have to be physically active to connect with your neighbor or with your friends or with your family in green spaces. And there is emerging research now around the impacts on sleep as well. Green space is helping us to get a better sleep at night. 
Uh, for me, that's a, the winning ticket because I find it difficult to get to sleep at the best of times. Uh, we've published some of the first research in the world which suggests that the odds of getting a better night's sleep improve where you have more tree canopy around in particular. And the final one, and this is where um, uh, some of what uh, Professor Yokohari mentioned earlier, reducing harms. In other words, keeping us cool, but also buffering us from the, the nasty stuff that's coming out of trucks and buses and cars, the air pollution, which is all too prevalent in many of the cities that um, we are living in today. And also the noise element as well. There are studies um, by colleagues over in Bulgaria and other countries too, which show that putting up greenery around where there are roads helps to take the edge off chronic noise and uh, helps us to feel a lot better along the way. All of these different domains of pathways intersect with each other in complex ways. And so this is purely a model, a simplification of reality. And what we find is that there's lots of contextualities as well, as I'll show you later on. So speaking of which, let's get on with it. I'm gonna go give you a whistle stop tour of some of the major studies and some of the new studies too that have come out of the Power Lab, the lab which um, I co-lead. And we're gonna look across the life course. So we're not just looking at one particular time in our lives, we're gonna look at the whole life. Let's get started. Let's look at pregnancy. Now, one of the meta-analyses which one of my PhD students recently published brought together work from all over the world, in countries from all over the world, and showed this, that those mothers who are giving birth in areas, living in areas where there's more greenery, more green space nearby, tend to have children who are healthier birth weight, have a lower risk of low birth weight. Now, many of you may go, well, that's nice, but why does that matter? Well, decades of medical research and health research have shown that low birth weight is a predictor of an increased risk of diabetes and heart disease and other cardiometabolic diseases later in life. So the better we can do earlier in life, the more we can promote a healthier start, the better for everyone. Green space could be a contributor to that through healthier birth weight. We haven't finished yet. Let's get on with looking at childhood. So here we have a study which was um, led by Xiao Chi Fang. And what she was able to do was look at data from um, thousands of children living in Australia and how they aged over time and how well they did over time. And importantly, where they were living over time too. And what she found was that those who had more greenery nearby, more parkland in particular, tended to have better mental health across the childhood um, that we were um, observing them from about age four up to age 13. And that's fantastic. But what we also found, and this is the real kicker here, a really important part is that the quality of the green space mattered too. The quality as um, understood by their parents. And you know, when you're a young kid, your parents are really important as to whether you're permitted to go and play in the green space or not. What they think of a green space as, as good quality, as safe, as an attractive place to be, really does matter. And what we find is that more quality green space nearby in particular is not only important for child mental health, and in particular depression and anxiety symptoms, but it grows over time too quality green space becomes more salient for child mental health as the children get older. Why might that be? Well, look at it this way. As you get older as a child, often, not always, but often, you're more in charge of where you go and play. You're more likely to be able to go and spend time outdoors without being chaperoned by your parents or your grandparents. You're more in charge, you're more autonomous. And that can mean whether there's good quality green space nearby becomes really important as to whether you get the health benefit. That's exactly what I think we're seeing here. Not only quantity, but quality. Speaking of quality green space, I don't know about you, um, but health is not just about what we can measure and what puts us in hospital or what keeps us healthy, but it's also influenced by things like kindness and volunteering and 
sharing of resources. In other words, pro-social behavior. We need a lot more of that in society. What another one of our PhD students in Power Lab has shown, again, tracking children over time, is that those who have more quality green space nearby tend to have more pro-social behavior across childhood and develop it more quickly as well. Who would have thought that investing in quality green environments wouldn't just be great from a point of view of our psychological health, but it may also help us to become more caring and sharing human beings as well. Fantastic result. Now let's skip up to adulthood. We talked about pregnancy outcomes earlier, and what about the mothers? Well, here again, another longitudinal study led by Xiao Qi um, found that over time, those mothers who had quality green space nearby had a 26%, 26% lower odds of developing psychological distress following childbirth. Absolutely fantastic result. And we need to do more of that. Here's one which I prepared earlier. Earlier this year, um, a longitudinal study of adults across the country. Um, basically, what we looked at was the risk of onset of loneliness. Now, loneliness is very underappreciated in public health, but it is consistently associated with incidents of heart disease and diabetes and, and even dementia. So we should try and prevent it as much as possible, but we don't really have any interventions to prevent it yet. Nothing that really works at, a, at an actionable population level. Except maybe we do. Greening may be part of the answer here, and you probably guessed that from the top. What we found earlier this year in a cohort of about 6,700 adults in Australia was the odds of becoming lonely among those who had 30% land use nearby as green space, as parkland, had a reduced odds of loneliness by a quarter. A quarter! Not only that. But even after taking into account things like age and sex and um, income and disability status and education and other things too, adults who are living alone, and that's an increasing number of us these days, adults who are living alone, if they had a 30% or more of local land use as parkland, had a half reduction in the odds of becoming lonely. These are staggering numbers. It's first cab off the rank analysis, as we like to say in Australia, we need more of this type of work. But what it indicates is that under our noses all this time, maybe green space can also help us to prevent loneliness. More work need to be done on that. Now, I should uh, uh, point out that when I say green space, and I've, sometimes I'm, measuring, I'm saying parkland, there are other types of green space that we should take into account, in particular, the different constituent parts, such as grass and shrubbery or bush, and also tree canopy. And tree canopy was mentioned earlier. That's what I'm going to focus on here. By looking at a very large cohort of nearly 50,000 adults in Australia and checking their mental health as it changed over time, we found that those who had more tree canopy within a short walk from home had meaningfully reduced odds of developing psychological distress. Now, not only is that an international first, but here's another one. We found that not only is it important for psychological health, but cardiometabolic health as well. Incidence of type two diabetes seems to be reduced by nearly 30% in those areas where tree canopy within a short walk from home is 30% or more compared to less than 10. It gives you an idea of what might be possible if cities in around the world, like, like um, Seattle and Barcelona and Canberra and, um, and Vancouver, were to realize their ambitions of achieving 30% canopy cover within the next 10 years. Just think, this could be potentially one of the health outcomes in our communities. Not only diabetes, but meaningfully reduced risks of developing uh, heart disease, hypertension, and even dementia in some of our most recent studies. Now, as I said earlier, in many countries around the world, there are already greening targets, and that's fantastic. Our research is also having impacts a little closer to home too. In Sydney, for example, directly referencing our work, 
City of Sydney um, I, I launched their strategy earlier this year, 377 million Australian dollars to back 700 new trees to be planted every year for the next 10 years. Wow. As well as investing in new quality green spaces and regenerating existing green spaces as well. This is game changing stuff and being partially driven by the health research that we've been able to produce in the power lab. Not only in Sydney, but also in areas such as um, in the Illawarra and Shoalhaven where the University of Wollongong, where I work is based, and also in Western Sydney, where um, in communities in Western Sydney, there are well above average levels of diabetes, heart disease, and depression as well. This is fantastic news, more power to the people who are delivering on the ground for us all. And with that, I'm going to wrap up a little bit by mentioning a couple of concluding points. We found that tree canopy is important. We found parkland is important and what a, a very rich uh, uh, range of parklands we have in Sydney, such as this one, which is in one of the most highly dense suburbs in the country, almost comparable to the density in Hong Kong and Singapore. It shows it can be done. You can see here that people are walking their dogs walking and taking time just to sit to recuperate and restore um, depleted psychological capacities. It's a place where communities can come together, but only if people feel it's high quality. That's such an important part. Green spaces which aren't, involved, aren't created with the involvement of local communities risk being places which nobody uses, nobody visits. We need to have consultation at every step of the way. And meanwhile, not just the green spaces people can visit, like parks, but also the tree canopy along the streets, which keeps us cool and makes them more pleasant places to walk on our way to the parks. Here you have two communities in Sydney, the, the North Shore, um, which is a, an affluent area. Prevalence of diabetes is just over 2%. And as you can see, leafy streets, which make it a cool and comfortable walk um, for whatever it may be, by walking next door to go and see your neighbor, walking down to the shops to, to pick up groceries, whatever it might be. In Blacktown, in the west of Sydney, where levels of diabetes are uh, reportedly at least seven, seven and a half percent, but um, my colleagues over in Western Sydney hospitals suggest it's probably a lot higher, unfortunately. You can see in Blacktown, there's not a lot of trees along where people are walking. So investment in tree canopy, not everywhere, in the places where we can do the most good, in places like Blacktown, where there is very, very little tree canopy to, be, to begin with. Who knows what the health benefits will be in areas where um, these tree canopy can be um, equitably um, planted and, and restored. And finally, I think it's high time that the health sector gets on board with championing investments in greener cities, in more tree canopy in particular, and not just fighting and shouting and saying yes to the urban plan as well done, but also by prescribing nature as well. When a person goes to see their GP or goes to see a, a, a consultant, and they may say, well, I've, I've not been doing too well recently, the, the GP or the consultant might say, well, I've got a prescription for you, and it may be a pharmaceutical, or it may be a referral to a psychologist, or it may be something else. But what about an adjunct prescription as well to get out into nature? Well, that might work for some people who already have the resources and motivation. How do we make it work for everyone? For everyone where there isn't necessarily good quality green space nearby? How do we empower people to get into nature? For people who work in factories and have many dependents to look after during the day, how do we empower them to get into nature too? How do we ensure that nature prescribing and investments in nature are reaped by everyone, not just people who are already benefiting, who are already healthy and wealthy? So that's a big part of the future research we're doing in Power Lab, and we've already got some funding on that. With that then, I bid you um, uh, adieu, farewell. Um, thank you very much for your time. If you would like to get in contact, please do. 
um, whether it's just to say hi or whether you would be interested in opportunities to work or study with us, here's my email um, and also my LinkedIn and Twitter uh, handles. Thank you very much indeed.